Okay, now we need to talk about conductors in, elect in electrostatic equilibrium. Conductors in electrostatic equilibrium. Let's make sure we understand all of the words in that. Conductor, Winter. That flow, that electric charges flow um, easily through, as opposed to in a, uh, um, an insulator through which it does not flow very easily. Electrostatic, Emily. Electric charge. Uh, right, but it's, it's basically saying the electric charges don't move around a whole lot, right? Uh, if we're talking about current and stuff, that would not be electrostatics. Uh, equilibrium. Catherine. Um, like it's not changing. Uh, right, it's not changing. Generally, we're talking about not accelerating, not changing. So we have a conductor through which charges flow easily in electrostatics. So we're talking about the charges, uh, and the whole thing is in equilibrium. There are four things that you need to know about conductors in electrostatic equilibrium, and I'm going to prove three of the four today. Unfortunately, the fourth one we cannot prove until we get a couple of chapters farther from where we are today. Now, uh, I will say that the AP test is not real good at identifying things in electrostatic equilibrium, so you may assume, if not explicitly stated, that something is in electrostatic equilibrium. Basically, if they give you something, for example, the free response question I handed you today, it doesn't specifically state that it's in electrostatic equilibrium, but if you look at it clearly, the object is in electrostatic equilibrium because the charges aren't moving around, they're just static. They're, um, therefore, it has to be in equilibrium. So this means there is no net motion of charge. <laughs> Number one, the electric field inside the conductor in electrostatic equilibrium is equal to zero. The electric field inside a conductor in electrostatic equilibrium is equal to zero. So, how do we know that? Okay, well, let's take the convert. Converse. If the electric field did not equal to zero, then there would be an electric force, which is equal to Q times the electric field. If there is an electric force on the charge, what happens to the charges? What? Well, they change. They'd move. Would it be in, equ in equilibrium anymore? No. So notice that the electric field inside has to be equal to zero because it's in equilibrium, there's no net motion of the charge. Therefore, uh, the net, the force on them, the electric force must, on them must be zero. Therefore, the electric field must also be zero. Number two, all excess charge is on the surface of the object. Note, of course, if Q total is not equal to zero. Okay, how do we prove that? Well, here we have a conductor in electrostatic equilibrium. Now, notice this is slightly different than what we did to begin with. What we have had to begin with was this, was uh, a thin and spherical shell with uh, charge evenly distributed throughout. What we have now is something that instead looks like this. <laughs> it's a conductor in electrostatic equilibrium. So here we have charges that could flow throughout the entire sphere. All right. All right, so what we've said is all the charges must be on the surface of the sphere. So let's use Gauss's law and we're going to draw our Gaussian surface. 
our Gaussian surface, we're going to draw such that the Gaussian sphere is has a radius just less than the radius of the sphere itself. Yes. You're just counting on how well you're doing. I, I was very careful on that. I don't know why. Uh, as opposed to the Q, for example, right there. Uh, so note that the, 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 the um, Gaussian surface is right near the edge. We already know from number one that the electric field inside this Gaussian surface is equal to zero, which means that the whole left-hand side is equal to zero, if the electric field is equal to zero. Therefore, the Q in divided by E naught is equal to zero. Therefore, the charge inside the Gaussian surface is equal to zero. Therefore, every charge must be outside the Gaussian surface. There can't be any charge inside that Gaussian surface. Number three. Yes. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> All right. So now that's uh, we now need to talk about number three. Number three is that we we know the electric field just outside the gas the uh, the conductor in electrostatic equilibrium. Number three, the electric field just outside. So the electric field, like right there, is equal to the surface charge density divided by E naught. Now, this is the surface charge density at that particular location. This, of course, give, opens the possibility for objects that don't, don't have a constant surface charge density. And that that, that that electric field must be perpendicular to the surface. Uh, yeah, so just to further specify here, so that surface charge density is equal to dq divided by dA at that particular location. So how do we know that? Well, first off, if the electric field, we'll just deal first with the perpendicular part, then we'll figure out the magnitude of it. But if the electric field has a component parallel to the surface, it follows this same statement. So if the electric field were had a component parallel to the surface, then there would be a force parallel, the electric force parallel to the surface, then the charge would move and it would not be in equilibrium. So it can't have an electric field component parallel to the surface or else it wouldn't go be in electrostatic equilibrium. And then, as far as figuring out um, the magnitude of it, we again have our object. We've identified that all of the charges must be located on the surface. So all the charges are located right here. We are going to figure out the electric field at this point. So we're going to use Gauss's law. Gauss's law, of course, is the electric flux is equal to the closed surface integral of E dot dA, which is equal to the charge inside the Gaussian surface divided by E naught. We draw our Gaussian surface, which again is going to be a cylinder, looks like this. Now notice, this is slightly different than what we had before, because now, we know the electric field inside this conductor is equal to zero. So the electric field inside is equal to zero, and we know the electric field outside looks like this. We know it acts like a point charge, so we actually know the electric field outside. We've got its value. So when we look at our Gaussian surface, uh, let's see, we have closed surface integral E dot dA, so it's E dA times a cosine of Again, the side um, is going to have a cosine of 90 degrees. 
but if we talk about the uh, E dA times a cosine of zero degrees, this is going to be for the left end of our Gaussian surface. This one right here. That's going to be the cosine of zero degrees. And that's going to be equal to Q in divided by E naught. What about the closed surface integral E dot dA for the right end? So, zero. Why? Or you could look at it as well. Well, actually, uh, there's charge here, but there's no electric field at this point, right? So the electric field is equal to zero. So this is equal to zero because the electric field is equal to zero. Yes, Ken. Uh, you know that the side is cosine ninety. There's like the side is cosine ninety. Sure. The direction of the electric field at this point is to the left. Correct at this particular point where we're putting our Gaussian surface. Looking for acknowledgement there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the electric field then is to the left. If we talk about the dA for the side, no matter which point we pick on the side, the angle between the dA, the uh, area vector for the side and to the left is 90 degrees. When you kind of feel like an inverted column, because like, I mean, yeah, for the center point, it's straight left, but like as you move, like... Ah, so the uh, Gaussian surface is considered to be very small relative to the size of the sphere. So then, all we have is the um, electric flux due to the left end. So we get on the left-hand side, this is just uh, E, because that's constant at this point times dA, and dA is just going to be equal to the E times the area of a single end this time, because the right end was had an electric flux of zero because the electric field was equal to zero. Again, we have the surface charge density is equal to Q divided by A, or in this particular case, the charge inside divided by the area of a single end. Therefore, Q inside is equal to the surface charge density times the area of an end. So we have uh, we have surface charge density times the area of an N divided by E naught. That's your well. 222. So you can see that the electric field is equal to the surface charge density divided by E naught at that particular location. Number four, the one that I told you I cannot actually prove at this point is this. For an irregular shape, <coughs> the surface charge density will be a max at the location where the radius of curvature is a minimum. The surface charge density will be a maximum where the radius of curvature is equal to a minimum. To understand that, I'm going to show you a figure because I do understand that that's not the most uh, common sense statement right there. So again, the surface charge density is going to be a maximum. In other words, you're going to have the most charges per area where the radius of curvature is the smallest. Today's desktop picture is a picture we were working on making our Christmas card picture, and uh, we all climbed on top of Ryan for the picture. And this is we have several pictures of making the Christmas card. You could it's over there. I have all, I have Christmas cards for eight years over there now. Uh, I, I can't find the first two for Ryan's for or Jay's first two years. I don't remember that one. All right, uh, let's see. It is a giant charged potato. So here we go. <laughs> Our giant charged potato. You can see uh, this is actually from chapter 25, but that, there are other things we're going to talk about this when we get there. Um, but you can see the radius of curvature is qu is larger here and is smaller here. So where there's a small radius of curvature, there is a larger amount of charge 
per unit area, whereas there is a larger radius of curvature, there is a smaller amount of charge per unit area. That's the fourth piece you need to remember for um, conductors in electrostatic equilibrium. And as I said, I cannot prove that one yet. Is that like a shell? It's just for any irregular shape. 